Before I go about covering this screed of an article that was published with regards to the American Psychological Association, before I cover this strange Play-Doh fantasy, as I shall soon term it in due course, I want you to get a sense of just how large, important, influential, wealthy the American Psychological Association is. So let me just read off the header of Wikipedia and a little bit of info. The American Psychological Association is the largest scientific and professional organization of psychologists in the United States with around 117,500 members, including scientists, educators, clinicians, consultants, and students. The APA has an annual budget of around $115 million. Interest groups covering different subspecialties of psychology or topical areas. That's a lot. That is a lot. That's a lot of money, and that is a lot of people. Now, what is remarkable about this publication, if you wish to call it that, is that, as you can see in the title, it is the APA's first ever set of guidelines for practice with men and boys. And here they are attempting to flex their wokeness. Now, I'm not going to read the entire article, but I will be posting a link, and I would encourage you to read it. But I thought it was very necessary to cover this because of just how ridiculous and silly it is, and I want to go into some analysis after that. So I'm only going to be reading the first bits and last bits just to give you that sense of how silly we are in our Play-Doh realm. For the first time ever, APA is releasing guidelines to help psychologists work with men and boys. At first blush, this may seem unnecessary. For decades, psychology focused on men, particularly white men, to the exclusion of all others, and men still dominate professionally and politically. As of 2018, 95.2% of chief operating officers at Fortune 500 companies were men. According to a 2017 analysis by Fortune, in 16 of the top companies, 80% of all high-ranking executives were male. Meanwhile, the 115th Congress, which began in 2017, was 81% male. But something is amiss for men as well. Men commit 90% of homicides in the United States and represent 77% of homicide victims. They're the demographic group most at risk of being victimized by violent crime. They are 3.5 times more likely than women to die by suicide, and their life expectancy is 4.9 years shorter than women's. Boys are far more likely to be diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder than girls, and they face harsher punishments in school, especially boys of color. APA's new guidelines for psychological practice with boys and men strive to recognize and address these problems in boys and men while remaining sensitive to the field's androcentric past. That's right, the androcentric past. Thirteen years in the making, they draw on more than 40 years of research showing that traditional masculinity is psychologically harmful and that socializing boys to suppress their emotions causes damage that echoes both inwardly and outwardly. APA's Guidelines for Psychological Practice with Girls and Women were issued in 2007 and, like the guidelines for men and boys, aim to help practitioners assist their patients despite social forces that can harm mental health. Many researchers who study femininity also work on masculinity. Several contributors to the guidelines for girls and women have also contributed to the new guidelines for boys and men. Quote, Though men benefit from patriarchy, they're also impinged upon by patriarchy, end quote, says Ronald F. Levant, a professor emeritus of psychology at the University of Akron and co-editor of the APA volume, The Psychology of Men and Masculinities. Levant was APA president in 2005 when the guideline drafting process began and was instrumental in securing funding and support to get the process started. Indeed, when researchers strip away stereotypes and expectations, there isn't much difference in the basic behaviors of men and women. Time diary studies, for example, find that men enjoy caring for their children as much as women do, and differences in emotional displays between boys and girls are small, according to a 2013 meta-analysis, and not always in the stereotypical direction. Getting the message out to men that they're adaptable, emotional, and capable of engaging fully outside of rigid norms is what the new guidelines are designed to do. 
And if psychologists can focus on supporting men in breaking free of masculinity rules that don't help them, the effects could spread beyond just mental health for men, McDermott says. If we can change men, he says, we can change the world. So let me remind you gentlemen again, the largest psychological association in North America, over $100 million in budget, and those are just snippets, read the whole thing. Now over the years of reading articles like this and investigating psychology in general, yeah, I know what to expect. And this doesn't surprise me at all. Nonetheless, I have to offer my analysis here and I have to point out what is quote unquote problematic here. I wanna get to the meat and bones here. The fact of the matter is that there's only one game in town when you're going to talk about psychology. Everything else, apart from that one game, is derivative. That's all it is, in as much as it's legitimate at all. And very little of what I just presented and read, and very little of what's in this article is legitimate. And when I say there's only one game in town, it's evolution. It's evolutionary psychology. We are evolved animals. Everything we do is a reflection of that, more or less. Everything we engage in, the activities, our behaviors, our psychology, these things are derivative. They are derived from a mammalian past that stretches back millions of years. And to ignore that is to do so at our own peril. And yet, whenever I read an article of this sort, I never see anything, anything referencing evolution, our biological prehistory, or specific trigger words, if you will, such as selection pressure or reproductive constraints, nothing of this sort. And it's for this reason that I can basically jettison something like this. And you can too, if you wish to do so. Everywhere we look, we see social dynamics that are ultimately reflective of an evolutionary past. Now what this article does and what everyone tends to do, and it's only natural, is that we human beings tend to focus on the proximate. Proximate meaning close by. We look at things, we look at behavior, we look at actions, we look at interests, and we say to ourselves, oh, this only makes sense in this context, in the context of the current cultural or social milieu. That explains everything. But what we always need to do, if we actually want to understand things, is to look at distal causes. The classic example, of course, is reproduction. Why do people like fucking? Because it feels good, right? But fucking only feels good because it was highly adaptive, that is in evolutionary terms, to create a mechanism whereby reproduction, copulation, was pleasurable. Because the name of the game in evolution is making copies of your genes. The fact that fucking is pleasurable is derivative of that name of the game. So yes, the immediate cause of why people like to fuck is because it feels good, they're fueled by their instincts, but the ultimate cause is, of course, reproduction. That's a very clear example. But the same is true of just about anything else. And the idea that men and women are not that different in terms of their behaviors is ludicrous and silly. The fact of the matter is, is that reproductive constraints have shaped both men and women over millions of years in as much as we had mammalian ancestors and hominid ancestors. These constraints and these pressures have had an enormous impact on individual behavior and general behavior of men and women respectively. And the fact of the matter is you can look at just about any activity. The fact that women tend to gravitate more towards people-oriented jobs and men towards thing-oriented jobs, or looking at even at video games, the fact of, for example, in the game Overwatch, the vast, vast, vast majority of female players play Mercy, a low-skill hero that basically is a heel bot, and men tend to gravitate more towards, say, DPS and tanks, and take your pick of any game of a similar sort. All of these things can be explained on evolutionary grounds. In fact, they're the only grounds that can offer an explanation. It has very little to do with socialization and culture because culture is always preceded by biology. There are biological constraints that feed into a cultural feedback loop. Now, of course, there is an interaction. It is a feedback loop. But if we were to go back, say, 2 million, 1 million, 500 years, it's very unlikely, for example, that Homo erectus 
had a culture, maybe a proto-culture of sorts, but the rules of Homo erectus were probably governed mostly by purely biological concerns. And if we were to go back to the common ancestor of, say, gorillas, chimpanzees, and Homo sapiens, you better believe they had almost no culture, and they were mostly concerned and mostly operating along biological constraints. And if you go even further back to the emergence of the first mammals, these shrew-like little creatures that emerged during and in the wake of the extinction of the dinosaurs, well, I can guarantee you there was no culture whatsoever. They had biological constraints. They had biological concerns. And so culture is largely and mostly informed by our biology. And reproductive biology is the name of the game here. And what that does to curtail certain things to allow for other things, that is the most important thing. And any time, and I want to make this very, very clear, any time you see any screed or article on psychology that is not playing the game of evolution, you can largely discard it. There's only one game in town, gentlemen, and when it comes to understanding human beings, or really any animal behavior, and that is taking into account evolution. Now, you can observe things in isolation, even neuropsychology. You can observe parts of the brain. You can observe different things that people do, and you can look at individual stats, sure, but it has to be in the broader context of evolutionary history, basically our biological past, because that is the only window that will allow you to understand these things. I want to make this 100% clear because I cannot stress this too much. I've stressed this for years, and I will never stop stressing this until I drop dead. This is very, very important. So that out of the way, all the reasons why we don't need to take this seriously. I think these people, these ideologues, and if you look at the sort of meat and potatoes of the article, it's filled with all sorts of things such as ethnic obsession, minorities, blah, blah, the usual, the, the usual of what we've come to expect. These people, I made reference to Plato. Some of you might not know what Plato is, especially if you're not American and grew up there. Maybe you had Plato in your countries. When I grew up in the 70s and 80s, though, we had Play-Doh. Play-Doh is this colorful clay-like substance that you can shape into different things. And you could even buy these Play-Doh sets. And you could create your own fantasy world. You could create buildings. You could make vehicles. You could shape it to your will and desire dinosaurs, whatever. And what I like in these so-called psychologists who are a bunch of toddlers who have created their own fantasy Play-Doh world. They have a massive Play-Doh set. And they have lots of money. They have over $100 million to sculpt and shape the Play-Doh. And they have become trapped in their own little Play-Doh ideological fantasy. And nothing external to that Play-Doh fantasy is allowed for admission. Now, this would all be well and good if they just existed into themselves and they had some space where they talked about their irrational and reality foreign delusions. But they have a lot of influence. And the problem with these guidelines, really, is that it doesn't map onto male reality. It doesn't map onto male psychology. For the reasons I've cited before, of course, you cannot talk about psychology of any sort without invoking evolution. It just doesn't work. Why do men behave in a certain way? They do so because men were shaped by selection pressures just as women were. There's a reason why men typically don't have a cry my heart out, powwow, to get rid of our feelings. We just don't operate along those lines. Typically, there might be exceptions. In fact, there would almost have to be. Exceptions do exist, but they're not the general rule. Men tend to engage in action. And the whole thrust of this article and the general push here, I can see the trend, is to, again, to feminize male psychology to create a psychological playground, a play doh ground, if you will, where men have to conform to feminize female expectations of what it is they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to express themselves. You're not going to get the male suicide rate down by saying, you just need to open up. You just need to have a good cry. We can all get together and have a good cry. That's not how men operate. We know that the male suicide rate has a lot to do with, and they mention this in the article briefly, unemployment, more importantly, has a lot to do with the very important shifts in the sexual market, and they don't mention this at all. The reality is, is that men tend to behave and have always behaved in compliance with what the female of the species expects. After all, the female 
selects, not the male. And women, despite what they say, don't want weepy, wimpy men. We're going to sit down and cry over my shoulder powwow. It just doesn't work that way. And so if you're going to address male problems, you have to do it, one, from the perspective of evolution, and two, from the perspective of reality. Even if every evolved male psychological trait were harmful, which is clearly not the case, you would still have to work with the constraints that exist. You couldn't just do away with them by well-wishing. And again, my issue here, apart from the absurdity and the inaccuracies and just the, the reality, foreignness of it all, is that these guys have so much influence and they're going to end up harming more than helping. I have no doubt that some of them at least want to help and they exist in their Play-Doh fantasy in their heads and want to proceed and do what they can, but this is not going to help anybody. And I want you, every time you look at an article on male psychology, to look very carefully. And if they don't mention anything about evolution or selection pressures or reproductive constraints, you can dismiss it. And so in contrast to what these guidelines claim to do, this is going to end up harming a lot more than it's helping. The first rule of thumb when it comes to helping people is you got to deal with the realities they live in. And the realities that men live in are not these Plato fantasies that these people have come up with over decades and decades. They claim 40 years of research have gone into this. My fucking God. I don't know what kind of research other than something like Harry Potter, but it is not reality. Gentlemen, there's only one game in town when it comes to talking about sex differences. And only one game in town when it comes to psychology, and that is evolution, evolutionary psychology. Anyway... I wanted to cover this. It's important just to bring this to your attention. I do apologize for my absence. I've had some serious health issues of late, multiple issues affecting me, old age, terrible flu, possible muscle tear causing agonizing pain. But again, I think I'm on the mend. So I will check you out later. And as always, may the gods watch over you. If you liked this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, Please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.